Welcome back. Good friend Jed Drinning, West Virginia football sideline reporter, also the signal caller. All things West Virginia football. And uh, Jed, I, uh, I am curious on your opinion on the basketball hire, but we'll get to that at the at the end. And I, I know that uh, everybody appears to be excited in Morgantown uh, about Darian DeVries and his uh, offspring on their way there. Uh, but football-wise, this was the biggest surprise in the Big 12 to the media who picked West Virginia last. And they've got momentum to build on. And in um, a, you know past years, the transfer portal was not their friend. Now they, they haven't lost anybody that um, would kind of undo things like they did the first couple years of the wide open transfer portal. Quarterbacks back, running backs are back. They've got guys coming in. Um, you know, the offensive line is 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 pretty well intact. What's uh, what's what's not working out for the for the Mountaineers in spring football right now? Well, let me start with this. Uh, I have undergoing a campaign in which I'm trying uh, with everything I can to encourage all media members to understand that our problems are just as vast right now as they were 12 months ago. So please, <laughs> once again, pick us dead last in the Big 12. Whatever you do, just make sure that you pick West Virginia last once again. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it would serve you well and it would serve us well. But, uh, but no, uh, you know, that was kind of the fuel that, that drove this football team all of last year. Uh, that refrain, I can't tell you guys how many times I heard the number 14 in the locker room on the sidelines throughout the course of the season. That level of disrespect, I mean, we we couldn't understand coming out of the 22 season. We won two out of three down the stretch. We kind of started to feel like we were finding our answer behind center and gear who played most of those games. We had the entire offensive line back, which we felt really strongly about. Uh, we had a couple key pieces back on defense, but there were some question marks. But we didn't think it, it translated to 14th, and obviously it did not. Now, as you touched on, we recalibrated. Uh, this is a whole new team in 24 with a lot of returning pieces. You start with some of those bells and whistles on the offensive side that you talked about. It's the first time in quite some time that, that uh, you have an established playmaker and difference maker returning at quarterback. and. And uh, it's not just Garrett, guys. I mean, the fact that we have Garrett and Nico Markey all back, mm-hmm. that room is really on solid footing. Uh, and we're excited about the possibilities for both of them because in today's game, you got to have two, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, especially with the nature of Garrett's game. The fact that we bring Jaheim White, one of the most electrifying freshmen in the country last year, back. The fact that C.J. Donaldson will be back. We have some of those key pieces. You can't replace Zach Frazier. Nobody's going to do that, or Doug Nestor. But we have some critical pieces back up front. Cole Taylor, playmaker at tight end. We have some of those toys on the perimeter. Uh, Traylon Ray at wide out. Rodney Gallagher at wide out. You talked about the portal. Here's where you start to see a bit of a difference now as opposed to, let's say, three years ago. We were all kind of, on some level, ambushed by how to uh, to handle the portal. Uh, Nobody really had their trust in order, including us. And there were defections at every turn, really, before you knew what hit you. But once you were able to orient yourself, and Neil Brown's the kind of guy that if you give him a puncher's chance to, to put a plan together and let the dust settle and figure things out, he will. And that's exactly what he's done uh, from a recruiting or from a scouting standpoint in the portal. And we hired a guy by the name of Drew Fabianich last year, longtime NFL head scout with the Cowboys. Uh, Drew is an incredible evaluator of talent. He's been a tremendous asset in, on the staff. And so he's really helped out with some of our portal additions as well. So we like where it's going. But we feel like it's on relatively full footing, but it's not really nearly where we want to get it because we want to be playing at Dallas. Yeah, uh, a- absolutely. So um, do, how much do you feel the momentum from last year and confidence is spilling over into this team? Because they played very confident last year and with a chip on their shoulder. Now uh, the we're going to sneak up on you factor is over. Yeah, I think there's some merit to that, to be honest with you. And I think the fact that we got there with such a physical brand of football last year, it speaks to the culture in the building. And once that culture is fortified and established, then it's just a function of finding the right pieces to continue with that culture. And they've gone to great lengths to do that. In other words, Neil is very measured in the risks that he does take and who he brings into the locker room because he wants to make sure that they're an addition to the locker room, not just to the roster. And we did a good job with that last year with the additions that we had. 
And I think that we're doing it again this year, both on the offensive and defensive side of the football. But I do think there's a certain, I don't want to call it swagger, because we've far from arrived. We won nine football games. We felt like we could have won more. Uh, but until you're competing for that conference championship at Jerry World, you, you really haven't arrived. Uh, but I like where we're at, and I think the team does have, to your point, a certain element of confidence that, that was probably – last year it was more about being ticked off and breathing fire uh, because they truly felt that, that they were underjudged and undervalued uh, when that came out. Uh, this year it's more about, hey, we got to take the next step. This is about us, not about the media. we got to take the next step and finish what we almost got done last year, and we're a couple games away from doing so. What what do you think is the biggest question mark for them that they that they still need to see here as spring goes on before they move into preparing for the summer? Well, I'd be remiss if uh, I'd say, well, yeah, we're just going to you know ha- watch Zach Frazier go on to the NFL and play mm-hmm. for 15 years for somebody and, and not miss a beat, right? Uh, now, we're happy with Brandon Yates uh, and what he brings to the table at center. He started elsewhere last year, and he came in in relief of uh, Zach last year, but you just can't replace Zach Frazier. So what's going to happen is there's a derivative effect unless you address it somewhere on that offensive line. If you're moving one of your top five down to center, well, you've got some questions elsewhere. Right now we have Tomas Remax, who are very high on left guard. He's fresh from All-American two years ago. He's out for the spring, so there's a bit of continuity missing there. And you have a defensive line. I mean, Neil just talked about this uh, today, in fact. You have a defensive line that uh, – that came out like gangbusters first day in pads last week in the spring. And that was because these guys on the defensive interior, they've been going against Zach Frazier for the last four years. Well, this, and they lost more than they won against Zach Frazier. Well, this was their first time to get a taste of the other side of that, and they kind of took it out on Brandon Yates, the interior of that offensive line. So we've got some growth that we have to, to go through. Uh, I would say it's going to have to start there. And how do you replace those missing pieces? And I think Doug Nestor's an NFL guy, too. Who's on, you know, finished us with right tackle last year. He's, he's off to the lead. Uh, so you got to replace those pieces, and that's not a given. I mean, we're high on some of the guys that are candidates to do that, but until it actually happens, you just don't know. We had Ren Baker on the show uh, last week, and and uh, you know we've known Ren a long time. Love love Ren. He's um, he seems to be loving it there, and he said the only thing he missed was he wanted us to send him some barbecue. Uh, yeah. from Texas. That's yeah. it. Uh, otherwise, he's loving it there at West Virginia. Now that the football situation at coach has, is settled and, you know, you hit winning season, um, everybody's happy. It looks like the arrow's pointed up and um, it, there. And now the basketball coach situation is settled because that wasn't just a fire a coach two weeks later, hire, you know, less than two weeks now, like in the next week, hire the next coach and move on. This has been a year long thing, uh, almost, you know, replacing Bob Huggins. Where do you feel the athletic department is as far as now being able to, as opposed to putting out fires, move straight ahead? Yeah. I I think that, that Ren's got a nice thing going, you know, he likes West Virginia. Well, West Virginia likes him in return. Uh, it's been a good fit for us. And, he hit with Coach Kellogg on the women's side last year. Great hire, that turned out to be. Uh, he he really hit a home run uh, from a volleyball hire standpoint. Uh, and, and you know, you got a situation in place where Randy Macy is about to step down at the end of the year, who's had such unprecedented success running the baseball program. Well, somebody on staff is the heir apparent. So that situation seems to be in good standing. So now when you turn to the men's basketball front, first of all, I'd be remiss if I didn't say hats off to Josh Eilert. I mean, what, what, what Yeoman's work, he attempted to do in almost impossible circumstances, had every chance in the world to make excuses, complain. He never did any of those things. He always took the high road in an age where the high road's uh, a lonely place to be. So, you know, hats off to Josh Eilert. But when you, when you look at who Ren targeted, uh, I just look at his track record in terms of there's certain things that he looks for in a coach from a program building standpoint. And, and I have to believe that he got it right again with this one. And not just because recruit number one was already in the living room, right? Yeah. Uh, not just because of that, but, you know, he, he drew from the, what's the old Abraham Lincoln quote? Give me, you know, uh, eight hours to chop down the tree. I'll spend six of it sharpening my axe. Well, Ren kind of played off of that a few weeks before the hire saying, 
look, I've been troubled in my ex for about six months. So I really do think that he was, he was calculated. He was methodical. He checked every box and he got the guy that he wanted. And it's a guy that, uh, didn't, wasn't just looking for a better job. He was looking for the West Virginia job because that's one of the things Ren commented on. He's like, look, when I made calls, I was starting to find out that he was somewhat giving the cold shoulder to other good jobs, but not to me. So, uh, I, I think there's something to that, but I think it's a good fit. Uh, and I think that people are, are once again going to be excited about West Virginia basketball, and the future is going to be bright. Yeah, the, you know, uh, having that number recruit in the living room uh, is yeah. is pretty great. Yeah. I mean, you know, especially when you know there was some thought he could go to the NBA. I, I know he's not quite ready for that, and this it's going to be it's going to be a, a a play around that they can build the roster around, and. Yeah. Uh, did you feel like from the fans, especially with basketball and, and how big a deal it was and look, it's, it's a complicated situation because Bob Huggins got fired. He was, and he had some things he has to, he had to work out in his life. It appears that he's getting healthy and getting a lot of perspective now, which, which everybody's yeah. thrilled about, but this is a dude that was, you know, well loved at West Virginia, you know, for ups and downs or a man, I wish they were better. Like everybody loved Bob Huggins for the most part. Right. Yeah, I, I don't think that, that anybody is eager to move on and forget about Hugs. Nobody ever will forget about Bob Huggins. How could you? Not just what he did coaching the basketball program, but what he did off the court. When you look at the money that he generated for the, the West Virginia Cancer Center and uh, all those ancillary things, secondary things that, that in, in many ways were more primary than what he did winning basketball games, uh, of course, he's near and dear to the hearts of many West Virginians because he's one of us, and he had missteps, no doubt about it. Uh, but you like to see that since that happened, it does appear, as you touched on, he's reinvented himself. And uh, he looks better, he sounds better, and you want nothing more than the absolute best for Bob Huggins, whatever form that might come in down the stretch. So I, I like to think that there's a world in which we can both have a successful basketball team on the court and we can uh, hold Bob Huggins dear. Uh, those things can coexist. Absolutely. Jed, uh, thank you so much uh, for hopping on with us, and uh, enjoy the rest of spring football as you you build into next season. I'm sure we'll have you on again soon. Absolutely. I'm enjoying a little bit of snow up here right now, actually, oh. guys. I'm on the mountain. We got the snow. Down the mountain has the flooding. So everybody out there, West Virginia, if you're listening, be careful. Uh, absolutely. Well, thanks, Jed. It, well, enjoy the snow. If, if you're a person that enjoys snow, I'm from the South. It terrifies me in a way uh, that I can't describe. We, we like to play in the snow. So I, I'm a four seasons guy for sure. Okay. Well, yeah, see, I'm a dyed in the wool Floridian and Texan. So <laughs> I don't, I don't understand snow on an emotional level. Like it's just <laughs> one of those things that f freaks me out. When we had the freeze here a couple of years ago, my wife, uh -huh. uh, we were dating at the time. She had come down to surprise me and she was like, is this what you're like all the time when the weather's bad? I'm like, no, just this <laughs> frozen hellscape that we can't escape. I'm I, like, if, if you did a horror movie about me, it would just be me in my house when it was cold outside. That's it. Boy, I, know yeah, I think you've got, a, but you've got a longer attention span than me. See, I need <laughs> diversity. I, I need things to be broken up. And if you break the gear up into quarters, my body's kind of calibrated that way. So as okay. soon as I do get a little tired of the snow, spring's here. As soon as I'm tired of the spring, summer's here, and then here come the leaves. So I couldn't live somewhere that just has one season. I'd lose my mind. In other words, it drives me crazy that people actually have pictures of Christmas and there's no snow anywhere. I'm like, how do you even tell it's Christmas? So anyway, but I get you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, great talking to you as always. Jed, uh, enjoy the weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it, guys. There you go. Yeah. Oh, man. Snow.